As a business and design leader, David Kelly doesn't really need an introduction. As one of the founders of IDEO, he's created one of the most influential design organizations in the world. Spanning 10 offices across three continents, David and his team have created countless products which impact us in a very everyday way, uh, in a very human way. From things as simple as the Apple mouse to those things as complex as surgical devices. And even new experiences like reimagining the voting process in America. How should we be voting? Broadly different areas that have helped, <clears throat> excuse me, broadly different areas that have a deep design ethos in each of them. And that's the key to David Kelly. Many of you are also aware of David's work at Stanford. He pioneered the founding of the Stanford D School, a unique program that brings together design practitioners, designers, and design thinkers from around the world to teach those skills to students. And at Stanford, that's where I met David. As a young student with a lot of hair, if you can imagine it, sorry for the shine, uh, <laughs> um, I, met, I had my first interactions with David. I didn't meet him as a business leader. I didn't meet him as a design visionary. I didn't meet him as the founder of IDEO. I met him as a teacher and as a mentor. David inspired me to take a path less traveled. He inspired me to apply the design thinking process not just to products and projects, but to my own life. He helped me to figure out my own creative confidence. He helped to nurture and grow that confidence in me, which changed the course of my life. I went from being just an engineer to being a design thinker. That confidence gave me the courage to build products which have gone on to affect millions of people. That confidence also gave me the courage to chart a path through some of the more challenging times of my own life. Now, the most amazing part about my relationship with David is that I'm not alone. David's warmth and empathy has impacted tens of thousands of people over the years. While David has created an amazing legacy with both IDEO and Stanford, I think his greatest gift to the world has been the multitudes of lives that he's touched as a teacher and as a mentor. David has uniquely influenced multiple generations of students and business leaders to reach their full creative potential. His warmth, his enthusiasm, his empathy for those around him is truly unique and truly contagious. It's an honor for me today to introduce David Kelly. Well, I just dropped somebody's card. <laughs> Good evening. First, I'd like to thank SV Forum, of course. I'm really honored to be here, and thank you very much for, for this award. I don't need to tell this audience that Silicon Valley is a special place. I feel so lucky to have ended up here, almost, by, almost randomly in my case. But when I'm at, when, wherever I am in the world and I say I'm from this part, of the, uh, this part of the world, when I say I'm from Silicon Valley, everybody kind of leans forward and gives me more credit than I deserve right away. You know, like, <laughs> you must be smart. You're from Silicon Valley. Well, it's, a great, it's a great start, you know, to, to, to think of that uh, in, in that way. But it is a place. It's a, this place, more than any place on earth, I think, you feel vital when, you, when you're here. You feel like you know what's going on in the world or what's about to go on in the world, what Tony or somebody is going to invent soon. I don't think you feel that way any place else in the world. In the, se the 70s were particularly wild and crazy around here. I really uh, enjoyed the chance to invent lots of things that didn't exist in the world before. But mostly I made a lot of friendships that I... Uh, continue to enjoy today and even up to today making more friendships all the time and I think that's a lot about what it's about. A huge part of my life was um, has been involved in the firm that I started 38 years ago called um, IDEO and I started with just a bunch of my friends from Stanford graduating from Stanford because we wanted to enjoy each other's company it wasn't really about even really that much about design it was how could we do cool stuff as friends. <clears throat> and I've really nearly enjoyed every day since that time. And those people are still there with me at, at IDEO today. I'm very proud of what IDEO has become. We started out only designing products, and I thought that was going to be my lot in life, and I wasn't so upset about that. You know, we were going to design more computers or, or uh, more chairs or whatever it is. It was going to be products, things that make a noise when you hit the ground. 
And, uh, but what's happened is an amazing thing, is that we moved from design to design thinking, and now we design a lot more than products. We design services and experiences and environments, and we really feel like we make m more of an impact. We were kind of used to be sitting at the kids' table, and now we've graduated to the adult table. And so we're doing things like safer food in China or sanitation improvements in Africa, better health and better patient care, you know, better government, uh, new schools in the, in the new school, school system for the country of Peru, and lots of innovations in transportation. So it's a, it's a kind of a different world for design. I'll tell you one quick story, which is a project that we finished recently for the, Santa Fe, the San Francisco Unified School District. They serve about 53,000 lunches per year, per day, I'm sorry, 53,000 lunches a day all year long. Um, and we went in there and we were going to look at uh, improving lunch and we get in there and pretty soon you realize kids are not eating lunch, people don't care about lunch. Our method is this human-centered method, this empathy, and it didn't take long before we realized that it wasn't about lunch, it was about a social experience. And what we should be doing is designing an extraordinary social experience. These kids have just come from classes where they weren't with their buddies, and now they're in this room, and all their friends are there, and they're standing in some silly line not being with them. So to make a long story short, we will serve those lunches in a different way in the future. The kids come in, they sit down with their friends, they're served kind of family style. And then there was a major breakthrough. We figured out they're sitting there, they're hungry, there's nothing else on the table, we'll serve the fruits and vegetables first. <laughs> they're, hung they're hungry. This is, I think this is the first time in history, you know, with teenagers eating fruits and vegetables. I'm also proud of my role at Stanford and the design community there. I've been at Stanford for 40 years. I'm proud of the D School, which you've heard about, and I'm also proud of the undergraduate and graduate design programs in, uh, in engineering product design. We do actually grant degrees to, to um, students. These are the students that we're making into the designers of tomorrow. The rock star designers, they come out of our undergraduate and graduate program. At the D School, on the other hand, we attempt to let everyone find their creative confidence. We take people who uh, have this kind of fear of being judged, uh, professors from all over the university, students from all over the university come together and they take classes and they work in teams and the end result is they transform into feeling like they're a creative person. You have, you have, as an educator, when you see somebody's eyes sparkle and they're in your office crying, talking about how good it feels to be creative in their body, and they've never felt that before, this is what keeps you going. An example of a project at the D School, I'll tell quickly, is uh, Embrace. Embrace is a company that kids who are students who were going to take perfectly good jobs at management consulting firms and banks and stuff, decided they would go and work on a problem in India of uh, low birth rate babies, that babies who are not making it because of low birth weight. And they started looking at incubators and found out that incubators were in the hospitals and that and they weren't doing much good. And so what they did is they went out into the villages using our methods of empathy and understanding and they, and they ended up developing a, um, basically um, a sleeping bag with paraffin in it that they can give to the mothers and the mothers um, can then, you know, these low birth weight babies, they can keep them warm enough, long enough for them to, to gain back weight. So that's been going, that's a few years now and they're on, on their way to saving hundreds of thousands of lives with this simple, you know, $12 uh, device. Anyway, so many of you know that um, a few years ago in 2007, I, um, I got a terminal cancer, a throat cancer, and basically they said you weren't going to make it, but I made it just so you know, to, you know, like you're, so no, there's no, the numbers, Fort, fortunate, fortunately, fortunately the statistics weren't quite right, um, and, um, but the reason I tell you that story is, uh, well, one, I, I really, um, recommend being diagnosed with a terminal disease. I mean, it'll, it'll straighten you right up. I mean, don't, d don't, don't actually get a terminal disease, but being diagnosed with it has some benefits. 
And, um, but what happened to me was you do find a calling, and so many people who talk about surviving cancer do, and my calling has been very clear ever since then. I believe I was put on earth to help as many people as possible gain their creative confidence, that there's so many people who were wishing that they felt the, the ability to achieve what they set out to do, and they somehow stumble and don't do that. And so through writing books and through what I do at IDEO for organizations and what I do at D School for Students, it's all about, about doing that. So I want to close by thanking a, a few people who have come here tonight with me. Um, so, you know, it was really hard for me to transition years ago from being the designer, the one that actually did the things, to being the person who built the stage that others perform on. It's, that's always been a, a difficult part for me. But, um, but design and life is a team sport. I mean, I, I couldn't get anything done by myself, really. I'm, and these people will tell you that's true, I, that I couldn't. I mean, uh, I'm not diligent enough to get anything done. But, um, but there are people who really make um, Stanford and IDEO work very well. So um, the first person I'd like to introduce is uh, or recognize is Bill Burnett. You want to raise your hand there or something? <laughs> Bill, Bill is the executive director of Stanford's design program. He's a tireless contributor. Um, he does everything in the program. He makes me look good. I just kind of fly around. Him, he, he teaches classes. He does all the finances. He manages our huge adjunct faculty staff. and. Um, all the time he's doing this, he's the academic advisor for over a hundred students. Thanks, Bill. And sitting next to him is the executive director of the D School, Sarah Stein Greenberg. So very little makes me as happy as walking around the D School and seeing what's going on there. In every nook and cranny, there's professors from all over the universities. We have professors from all seven schools. I don't know who these people are, but they're running a big, uh, they're running a big workshop or a class, and they're, the students are from all over the place, and everybody's happy. It's an opt-in culture. We don't pay the professors, and we don't give credit mostly to the students. They're there because they want to be there. Well, um, th the... Every nook and cranny is just full in this place. It's really exciting. And the play, this is all due to, I believe, Sarah's leadership. It's really hard to run one of these quirky places with all these creative people and actually get them to do something, to do something sustainable. They're, they're really good at doing something extraordinary, but rarely does it be, is it sustainable if they, if, it, if they don't, haven't talked to Sarah. So I think she's juggled all of this work with a perfect tone. And I'm really grateful to her. Thanks, Sarah. And last person, the last, last person I want to introduce is uh, Bernie Roth, who's sitting next to Bill. And Bernie, Bernie's, Bernie's a longtime colleague, a friend of mine, and mentor. Um, and I, I couldn't have navigated Stanford without Bernie. Bernie's the real deal. You know, he's a professor of kinematics, and he writes books that nobody understands except him and three guys. And, you know, I mean... <laughs> He's a, real, he's a real academic. But, um, but every time I needed to get something like tenure, you know, or I, 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 needed, I needed to get to, to the dean to understand what we were doing is important, Bernie was always there using his clout and his intelligence to win them over. Another really fun thing to watch was Bernie's transformation as a professor. When he took over from the D, he took over the D school when I got sick and uh, he, ha he won't leave, we can't get him to leave. Um, and he, um, he doesn't teach as many kinematics classes, he mostly is teaching, you know, designing for your life kind of classes. He also, I'll give him a plug, he also has a new book com coming out called The Achievement Habit, which is a great read. Thanks, Bernie, and thank you.